Hey guys, how's it going? I um, want to make sure that I give you some supplementary information here that you may not have found in your research. So here we go with some notes on F. Scott Fitzgerald and the Great Gatsby. So uh, Gats or Gatsby, Fitzgerald was actually born September 26, 1896 in St. Paul, Minnesota. Now Fitzgerald is about as close as we come to a local boy when it comes to the authors that we have read throughout the course of the year. Now, Fitzgerald's family grew up in a time where even some of the most affluent people did not have running water or electricity in their homes. This is actually a picture of the house that Fitzgerald grew up in, and he did not have electricity when he was a child. So uh, he was a very protected child. Before he was born, his parents had lost two sisters to the flu. And so mom was very overprotective and had some very high social ambitions for her son. Unfortunately, the Fitzgerald family was not very successful in uh, life in general. Mom had some social status. She came from a very rich, very affluent family. Dad was kind of a failure in business. Uh, he was a pharmaceutical salesman for a while and didn't do very well at that. He opened up his own wicker furniture business and that failed. So... Um, Fitzgerald just, his, his dad just did not do very well with things. So his mom used what social influence that she and her family had. She actually borrowed money from a rich uncle to make sure that Fitzgerald went to a private Catholic school and then on to Princeton. I mean, here's a picture of him at private Catholic school. These are some pictures that were taken of him while he was at Princeton. You know, he started writing while he was in high school. But it was at Princeton that he really developed his fascination with the ultra rich. And that fascination comes through in his writings. It's his writings are very self-conscious in nature. And he knows there's a difference between people who have a little bit of money and people who have more money than their grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren can spend. He wanted that ultra rich, ultra wealthy lifestyle for himself. And he wasn't going to stop at anything until he got it. Ironically enough, he actually ended up leaving Princeton before he got a degree. Um, he enlisted in the Army in 1917 and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Now, Fitzgerald thought that he was going to end up fighting in World War I. And so he very quickly finished off his writing his first novel, sent it off to his publishers, and his publisher rejected it outright, said it was juvenile and amateurish and it needed a lot of work. Well, during this time, he also met Zelda Sayer. She was the daughter of, oops, she was the daughter of a local, um, uh, of an Alabama Supreme Court justice. And she was very rich. And Fitzgerald and Zelda actually came from two different worlds, but he managed to convince her and her family that his family was also very well to do. And they had this whirlwind romance. And during this time, he continued to revise his novel, and he sent it back into publishers, and it was rejected again. Now, at that point, Zelda realized that Fitzgerald could not keep her in the lifestyle to which she had become accustomed, and so she broke off their engagement. He moved to New York City to try to make it in advertising so that he could show her that he had money and status, and he failed in advertising, so he ended up moving back to his parents' house in St. Paul to work on revising his book. He ended up submitting it a third time to publishers, and This Side of Paradise was published in 1920. It was praised for its originality and hailed as the story of the youth of our generation. He called Zelda up and said, hey, I got a lot of money from publishing this book. You want to get back together? She said, sure. And they very quickly were engaged, and their daughter, Frances Scott, was born in October 1921. Now, the name Frances Scott is a family name. F. Scott Fitzgerald is named after one of his very famous cousins down the line, Frances Scott Key, the author of The Star Spangled Banner. And so the name Frances Scott has been carried on through the family line. Um, his daughter was known as Scotty for a good portion of her life. Now, Fitzgerald and his wife had a whole, suddenly had a whole bunch of money. They were very rich, and they had a lot of influence, 
And the beginning of the 1920s was just this like huge, like party. The 1920s was really the first, if it feels good, do it decade. Everything in the 1920s was about challenging the establishing the established order. It was about personal indulgence, sometimes to self-destructive excess. And Fitzgerald and his wife were a huge part of this lifestyle. He became the self-proclaimed spokesman and symbol of this decade. Now, so much of what was happening in the 1920s was all about making money as quickly as you possibly could. The politicians of the time had a lot to do with that. Now, Woodrow Wilson was the president uh, when the 1920s started. He was the former president of Princeton. He was an academic. And up to this point, the State of the Union address had been a written address that had been like hand delivered to Congress by a messenger. Uh, Wilson brought back the spoken State of the Union address, and it's been that way ever since. He also reintroduced the income tax. Wilson also made sure that he did what the voters wanted him to do. The nation did not want to be a part of World War I, and so he maintained a policy of neutrality in the war. When it was time to jump in, however, he jumped in feet first, uh, introduced the Selective Service Act, and at the end of the war, Wilson helped con conclude the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I and punished Germany for what they had done. Unfortunately, Wilson is remembered most probably for his biggest failure, the League of Nations. It was the predecessor to the United Nations. He wanted to see people um, come together as, in one world government that would handle big things like wars and war criminals and things like that. Unfortunately, when Wilson left office, the League of Nations kind of died with him. Nobody had any interest uh, in being part of a one world government or any kind of one world organization. Uh, Warren G. Harding took over as 29th president, uh, but he was only president for two years. Harding died in office of a, cere of a cerebral hemorrhage. And he was immensely popular while he was in office. But after he died, it was discovered that he had all of these scandals that were lying underneath the surface. You know, the Teapot Dome scandal, where he was selling off the nation's strategic oil reserves, to his buddies who were making a ton of money off of it. Um, there was scandals in the Justice Department where they were throwing cases or not prosecuting cases that needed to be prosecuted. Uh, corruption and graft in the Veterans Bureau. He even had a couple of affairs while he was in the White House. None of this stuff came out until after his death, but because of what he had done, the nation completely lost faith in the office of the presidency. He was... Pre um, he was succeeded by his vice president, Calvin Coolidge. Now, Coolidge was much more calm and straightforward. He had the nickname Silent Cal. He very famously said, you walk softly and carry a big stick. Now, Coolidge worked very hard to clear out corruption. He finished out the last two years of Harding's presidency and then uh, won his own first four-year term. He ran on low, talk, low taxes. He opposed the farm subsidies, supported civil rights to an extent, uh, but still wasn't ready to um, do away with Jim Crow laws. Now, Coolidge was not an isolationist, but he was very reluctant to get involved in foreign affairs. Now, Coolidge's policies actually helped lead to the Great Depression. A lot of people think that uh, it's his, pred or it's his uh, successor that's to blame, but Coolidge was one of the ones who was mainly responsible. Coolidge actually has an interesting local connection as well. Um, he spent the summer of 1928 at the State Game Lodge in Custer State Park, and he used what we now know as the Rapid City High School building uh, as his summer office. The building that he actually used was attached to the current uh, Rapid City High School, and it burned down. But the desk that Coolidge used in his office was the desk that was used by every principal in that building until Rapid City High opened up. You can still see the desk. It still sits in the lobby down there. Uh, Coolidge actually announced from that building that he would not be seeking a second term as president. Herbert Hoover took over for Coolidge. Hoover is wrongly blamed for most of what happened uh, in the Great Depression. He took over just a few months before the Great Depression started. And he is blamed for a lot of the 
uh, poverty and death and things that occurred. Um, he's very famously known for um, Hoovervilles, little shanty towns that sprang up as homeless people were you know, drifting across the nation. Um, Hoover believed very strongly, though, in the, what was known as the efficiency movement. The government needed to be as small as possible and as efficient as possible. Uh, he believed in a balanced budget. Uh, and he actually helped make the Great Depression a little bit less serious. Uh, some of the programs that he started ended up leading to Roosevelt's New Deal. Now, I mentioned the politics in this section because... Uh, there's just this social atmosphere of change that was going on. The politicians themselves believed very strongly in a laissez-faire government. They wanted to keep government regulation off of business and let businesses make money in any way that they saw fit. Um, but with the start of the Great Depression, you also saw um, prohibition become a serious issue. Now, the 18th Amendment was passed of prohibiting the production, sale, transportation, and distribution of alcohol. You could still drink it, but you couldn't buy it or ship it legally. So it was produced and transported illegally. Uh, you had the rise in what was known as bathtub gin, people literally cooking up batches of booze in their bathtubs. Uh, it was so poisonous, so poorly regulated, that many people ended up getting sick and dying from it because they were poisoned by this, you know, unregulated alcohol. It also led to the rise of speakeasies, secret underground clubs that would be hidden in a basement or in a back room, and you either had to have the password or know somebody who knows somebody who could get you in. And speakeasies oftentimes were connected to organized crime. They were supplied by bootleggers, guys who would ship in Canadian whiskey and Caribbean rum. And it gave rise to gangsters like Al Capone. Capone was one of the most famous gangsters in the 20s and 30s because he profited greatly off of prohibition. You know, it's a fun side note, you know what they actually nailed Capone for? Tax evasion. They busted him for not paying his taxes. Not for murder, not for corruption, not for smuggling or bootlegging, but tax evasion. We also saw a changing attitude towards women in the 1920s. Now, again, World War I was very similar to World War II. Guys um, would go off to fight, so women had to fill roles in offices and in factories. Well, up to this point in history, women were largely dependent on men for their sources of income. If they held a job outside the home, it mirrored the domestic capacities that they had. They were nurses or laundry workers or waitresses or secretaries. Very often, these women did not have their own money, their own sources of income. Well, by the time World War I ended, there were nine million women in the workforce, and these women were not about to give up their freedom and independence just so men could have their factory jobs back. And then came the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, which finally granted women the right to vote that they had fought so hard for. Now, up to this point, men would go out to bars and drink and smoke and have fun, and women would go do something else. You all have seen the movie Titanic, right? There's that scene where Jack has dinner with Rose, and near the end of dinner, Rose leans over to Jack and says, now it's time for brandy and cigars in the library. They retreat into a crowd of smoke and congratulate each other on being masters of the universe. It's exactly what it used to be like. Guys would go drink and smoke in the bars and women would be expected to go do something else. Well, now suddenly you had these women who were making their own money, living their own lives. They could drink and smoke in public. They bobbed their hair, cut it very short. And they wore these short little dresses that would flap around when they dance. These women became known as flappers. They were the quintessential liberated women of the early 20th century. You also had changing attitudes towards minorities in this time period. Now, Jim Crow laws were still in effect. And so people of color were banned from you know, hanging in certain places or doing certain things. But this was also the birth of the jazz age, where you saw the rise of jazz music. It was tied into the Harlem Renaissance. 
Now, this movement gave voice to the voiceless and gave a, a, a whole group of people an opportunity to express themselves in ways that had not been done before. Creole and Cajun music blending with Negro spirituals led to this uniquely American art form that was known as jazz music. It became very, very popular with upper middle class and upper class white people. They would go to places like the Cotton Club to see performers like Dizzy Gillespie perform. But you couldn't be a black person and be a customer in these clubs. You could work in the kitchens or bus tables or mop floors or be a performer, but you couldn't yet be a customer. And this music in the Harlem Renaissance actually gave birth to some of the early founders of the civil rights movement as well. Overall, in America, this was a time of optimism in American history. Again, the lack of government regulation meant that corporations were making money hand over fist. It also meant the birth of the modern advertising age. And so suddenly everybody wanted the Ford in their garage and the GE refrigerator in the kitchen and the Pepsi toothpaste in the bathroom. And it gave rise also then to the modern credit market where you could buy a credit card or apply for loans through banks to get those cars and refrigerators that your neighbors had and you wanted so badly. We also saw the rapid growth of industry and mechanization, meaning that people could get access to things like cars and mass-produced refrigerators very easily. You also see the wide distribution of the blessings of civilization, like electricity and the automobile. Overall, it was a great time to be an American. It was this new golden age in America. But just like any time, there were critics of this time period as well. They saw people taking out credit that they couldn't afford to pay to get refrigerators and cars and houses that they couldn't afford to pay for. And they saw people valuing things instead of people and they were caught up in a surge of materialism and people were forgetting the to, to grasp the meaning and significance of life people also became very disillusioned disenchanted and lost faith in life and possibility of social progress and they had a total lack of interest in politics they didn't feel that anything could change or that anything ever would change so why should they bother trying sound familiar a little bit like what's happening in our country right now, it led to the rise of the expatriate movement. These people were also known as the lost generation. This is a group of people, especially artists and authors, who went and lived in some of the great cities of Europe for a time from the uh, end of World War I until the beginning of the Great Depression. Now, these are people who had seen war, death, and destruction on an unprecedented scale. World War I had seen the advent of three horrifically efficient methods of killing your enemies. The machine gun, the airplane as weapons delivery system, and chemical weapons. These things killed more people than had ever been killed in war up to that point. And people became very disillusioned and jaded when it came to post-war society. The idea of the expatriate or the lost generation was popularized by Gertrude Stein and Ernest Hemingway. And it was these people were seen as a broken generation where virtuous behavior no longer existed, faith and religion was broken, and a connection to morality was questionable at best. People felt that life in the cities of Europe was better than living in a country that was broken and would never be repaired. Now, Fitzgerald and his wife fell into this expatriate lifestyle. They lived in London and Paris for a time before returning to New York City. But their lives were famously rootless. They traveled and they drank and they partied. Uh, there were rumors that both Fitzgerald and his wife uh, had had affairs with younger men. None of those rumors ever really came to pass. But the morality was questionable. And they really had nothing left to believe in. 
Zelda and F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, drank excessively, partied hard, spent more money than they had. They're very well known for this glamorous and unsettled life. Fitzgerald's second book, The Beautiful and Damned, focused on the these different aspects of this life. That book was published very shortly after they had moved back to New York City permanently. Now, Zelda had been suffering from different episodes of mania, they called it. We know it today as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. She had been in and out of a mental hospital her entire life, and the alcohol didn't make it any better. So Fitzgerald didn't really have many literary successes uh, in the few years following The Beautiful and Damned. Uh, he published a couple collections of short stories, both of them were critical failures. So he changed the focus of his writings to some serious and even tragic works that address broad historical and social issues. And The Great Gatsby was born out of this. Uh, it was seen as this great success. Both critics and audiences loved it. They said it was a quintessential story, not only of the 1920s, but of the American experience. And so the novel chronicles the exuberance and the malaise, both the highs and the lows of the decade, and shows how America's fascination with material things can erode their values. And it also shows the ultimate failure of the American dream. You can fight hard to achieve success, and you can gain every single thing that you might think will make your life wonderful. And it's still never going to be enough. Now, unfortunately, Gatsby was did not... Um, remain popular for long. People didn't like being lectured about how horrible their lives were. They especially didn't want to hear about it when it was their own life that was being put on trial. And so the popularity of Gatsby very quickly declined. But again, Fitzgerald focused very heavily on this idea that the American dream was not achievable. The American dream describes an attitude of hope and faith that looks forward to the fulfillment of human wishes and desires. It comes from the founding words, or from the words of our founding documents. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The reality, though, for many people is not life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. In the 1920s, much like in today's society, it's poverty, it's discrimination, it's exploitation, it's hypocrisy where they promise everything and deliver nothing, it's corruption in government, it's suppression of those who share different opinions. The American dream is hardly achievable for many people. Now, F. Scott Fitzgerald's career kind of followed that path. I mean, he started to see the decline of the American dream. He had been an alcoholic since the age of 22. At one point, he earned the dubious title of America's drunkest writer. Now, as the 20s came to a close, so did Fitzgerald's serious writing career. Uh, he published a fourth book called Tender as the Night that was based on his wife's mental illness. She had been in and out of mental institutions again her entire life. She was finally committed full time uh, in the late 1920s. And Fitzgerald was broke. He and his wife had spent so much money that he didn't have enough to be able to pay her medical bills. So he started writing short stories, magazine articles, and even though he hated Hollywood with a passion, he moved there and started writing screenplays to pay her bills. It was while he was living there, December 21st, 1940, he died of a heart attack due to complications from alcoholism at the age of 44. Now Fitzgerald died thinking that his life was a complete and utter failure. The Great Gatsby sold six copies in 1940. It wouldn't become successful until after World War II. Now, the writer, or the publishing company, had retained the rights to his book. And in the middle of the war, the publishing company printed half a million copies of different novels, including The Great Gatsby, 
to be circulated through the trenches in Europe and on naval ships to keep the soldiers and sailors happy. Fitzgerald ca or men came home from the war carrying copies of the Great Gatsby in their pockets and passed it on to friends and family members. By 1946, The Great Gatsby was number two on the New York Times bestseller list. Zelda, unfortunately, didn't live much longer. She, again, was committed to a mental institution, and there was a fire in the hospital where she lived. Uh, the fire started in the kitchen and raced up the dumbwaiter shaft, which was wood, and quickly spread to every floor. Zelda and five other women were found right inside one of the emergency uh, escapes, and they, where they had died from burns and smoke inhalation. And she was 48 years old when she died. After her death, Fitzgerald's body was exhumed and they were moved to St. Mary's Cemetery in Rockville, Maryland. There they share a grave and the last sentence of the Great Gatsby is inscribed upon their grave marker. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Now Gatsby has lived on in popular culture. Uh, it, there have been three different um, ballets, uh, a musical, uh, two books, several other adaptations, including five TV and film adaptations. The first one was done in 1926, starred, Robert, or starred Warren Baxter, Lois Wilson, and Neil Hamilton. Uh, Fitzgerald and his wife famously stood up and walked out of a showing of this film. It focused too heavily on the hard partying lifestyle, the carefree, easy life that they had lived. They hated it. Uh, this film actually no longer exists. There's two reasons for that. The first is the celluloid film that was used to record the movie does not hold up very well unless it's kept in very specific environmental conditions. Uh, so it degrades very quickly. Uh, the second is because at Paramount, there was a massive warehouse fire and dozens of silent films were lost, including The Great Gatsby. The only things that still exist are the original movie poster, which is this, and uh, the original trailer which was actually included in the 2012 DVD release as a special feature. And then we see the 1949 version with Alan Ladd, Betty Field, Shelley Winters, and McDonald Carey. Uh, this one was much more popular. I believe it was nominated for several Oscars. Uh, Shelley Winters and McDonald Carey were still active in Hollywood uh, up until the mid to late 90s. Um, McDonald Carey played... Grandpa Brady on this uh, soap opera Days of Our Lives, and Shelley Winters played Roseanne's mom in the sitcom Roseanne. Uh, there's a 1974 film version starring Robert Redford, Mia Farrow, Bruce Dern, Karen Black, and Sam Waterston. Uh, this screenplay was written by Francis Ford Coppola. This one, again, immensely popular. I tried to sit down and watch it at one point. Couldn't make it all the way through. It was deadly boring for me. There was a 2000 version starring uh, on A&E as a made-for-TV movie starring Mira Sorvino as Daisy Buchanan, uh, Toby Stevens as Jay Gatsby, and Paul Rudd as Nick Carraway. Yes, that's actually a young Paul Rudd right there. But I still have not found that one. I'd like to find it and see what it's like. Then, of course, the one that everybody knows is the 2012 version, it was originally going to be released December 21st, 2012, which would have been the anniversary of Fitzgerald's death. It was released in early 2013, starring Leonardo DiCaprio as Jake Gatsby, Carey Mulligan as Daisy Buchanan, Toby McGuire as Nick Carraway, and Isla Fisher as um, Myrtle Wilson. This movie actually won two Oscars, one for costumes and one for set design. Of course, nothing for my man Leo. Of course not. Why would you? So you can't talk about 
the 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 book without talking about the cover art. Fitzgerald actually saw this and decided that he needed to go back and rewrite portions of The Great Gatsby to include mentions of this uh, cover art in the book. So you have what is like a woman's silhouette in this very deep navy blue skyline. Her ruby red lips stand out. She has a single green tear running down her cheek. The irises of the eyes are actually reclining female nudes. And it's all suspended above this circus-like atmosphere, these beautiful, brightly lit uh, skyline. It was made by a man named Francis Cugat. And when Fitzgerald first saw it, he said, don't do anything with this. I want that painting. And it's the original cover art. It was taken off the cover and on a couple of different editions, but has been on every published edition of the book since 1972. It is one of the most iconic covers for any work um, from Fitzgerald's time period. All right, guys, there you have it. Those are supplementary notes for The Great Gatsby, and I'm going to make sure these are linked on the homework calendar so you've got access to them. Um, and we're going to start reading the book, so I look forward to it. I absolutely love this book. I hate every single one of these characters by the end, and you'll see why. <laughs>